Hey fans, welcome back to the B&O Railroad Museum. Uh, once again, we are in the cab of Chesapeake and Ohio H8 Allegheny number 1604. Uh, the first time we were here, we made a general overview of the locomotive. Uh, the second time we were here, we took a look at the air brake setup on this locomotive. So for our third visit, I want to focus a little bit more on the water supply apparatus that comes equipped on this class of locomotives. So we're going to start over here on the right hand side, on the engineer's side, uh, with the Nathan 4000 uh, automatic restarting injector. Um, so first time we were here, I went over uh, briefly how this operated. Um, this was a number of years ago now, uh, just before the pandemic started actually. So at that time, I did not have a complete understanding of how injectors work so i didn't know fully uh how to explain everything about this injector but uh just to give you a quick overview of this uh piece of equipment the nathan 4000 was probably what you would consider one of the most modern pieces of water injection equipment available to uh, railroads um, towards the end of the steam era. Um, this was known as an automatic restarting injector, so that means that if the injector was running and for some reason the water supply was interrupted and then it uh, it was uninterrupted, the, the injector would automatically restart without the engineer or the fireman having to do anything to facilitate that restart. Um, it's an in the injector is a single handle operation as you can see here there's no separate uh water valve that you have to open or close the ha single handle operation takes care of that so currently the injector is in the closed position um you can see here there are a number of teeth on the quadrant so if we sit down excuse me if we sit down and take a look a little bit closer at the quadrant. You can't really see too well. It's a bit dark. So I'll probably attach a, an older photo I've taken of this just for clarity's sake. Um, but currently the injector is in the shut off position. The first set of teeth here is the priming notch. Uh, and then back here you have your regulation zone. So this zone is where the injector is actually operating. Um, the way the injector works, of course, is that you would have to lift the handle into the priming notch for a few seconds. Um, and what that does is that's going to crack open the water supply valve and also the steam supply valve from the boiler um, just a bit so that the injector starts to fill with water and steam, uh, but not enough to create the vacuum that starts the injector and rams the water through the boiler check valve into the boiler. Um, once the injector has been primed, which you can tell by leaning out the side and looking at the overflow pipe to see if the water and the steam has started to come out of the overflow, then you would move it into the regulation quadrant to start the injection of the water. So. Just really quick, I will demonstrate this process uh, once from this view and then once from the opposite side of the cab. Um, I'm going to dub in some sound effects uh, record as, recorded off of the Nathan 4000 live injector to make this sound a little bit more realistic. So we're going to prime it. And then we're going to start it. Now, in this position, uh, this is the wide open position, so you're getting the maximum amount of water flow into the boiler. Um, on this specific locomotive, it's equipped with a Nathan 4000C quote unquote special size. So the regular Nathan 4000C was sized for 12,000 gallons per hour, um, but Nathan offered uh, nozzle sizes uh, for up to 14,500 gallons per hour. Um, the Allegheny is fitted with a nozzle 
to supply 13,000 gallons per hour on the Nathan 4000 injector. So this is currently in this position, this is 13,000 gallons per hour. And as we move it back towards the minimum capacity notch, usually that about cuts the capacity to down to about anywhere between one half and one third. Alright, so now that we have a general overview of how the Nathan 4000 injector is operated, I want to go a little bit more in depth and talk about why this overflow valve exists over here behind the uh, operating handle of the injector. But in order to understand why this overflow valve exists, we need to first talk about what the purpose of an overflow to an injector is. So. I'll start off by saying that the Nathan 4000 injector uh, has what you would term an automatic overflow. So when the injector is off, the overflow is quote unquote open. Uh, and when the injector is running, the overflow is closed. Um, now this red overflow handle here, this overflow valve, I should say, is for the engine crew to manually shut the overflow valve to prevent the overflow from opening. Now, why is that the case? Why would you need to do that, you ask? Um, I'll get to that eventually. But I wanna talk about now uh, more in depth how injectors work in general, because we need to sort of understand that principle before we can really talk about what that overflow valve is there for. So the way an injector works is that you have two supply pipes. You have the, the piping from the tender, which carries the water underneath the locomotive into the body of the injector up to the water valve. And then you have the piping from the boiler, which carries the live steam down underneath to the body of the injector up to the steam valve. Uh, once again, when you go to start the injector and you move the operating handle into the priming notch, what that does is that now cracks open uh, both the water valve and the steam valve to a slight degree, which allows water and steam to start entering into the injector body. Now, the steam goes through what is called a, a steam nozzle. Um, 
between the steam nozzle and the combining nozzle, there's a gap uh, where the water that is in the body of the injector can flow in. And then between the combining nozzle and the delivery nozzle, there's another gap um, where water can flow in or out, or whichever way it, it wishes to. So in this priming position, the injector is not injecting water into the boiler. The water is flowing into the injector from the tender, uh, flushing out any air that's inside the injector body, and then flowing out of the overflow. Um, this happens because there is positive pressure inside the injector, which lifts the overflow valve. Uh, if this is confusing at all, I will be including photos and diagrams, and I'll try to circle what I'm talking about as I'm talking about it. Um, so hopefully that'll make it a little bit less confusing. Uh, but anyways, once the water starts to spill from the injector uh, and your injector is primed, what you would then do is, once again, you would move the injector operating handle into the wide open position to start the injector. Um, what happens then is now both your water valve and your steam valve are open wide. And when that happens, the steam enters in through the steam nozzle, which starts off small and expands into a wider diameter. What that does is that brings the pressure down, the pressure of the steam down from boiler pressure to basically atmospheric pressure but in that process, that converts the pressure into velocity. So now the steam is, is, is gone from high pressure, low velocity to low pressure, high velocity. Um, and that high velocity, low pressure steam now hits the water and travels through the combining cone. Um, uh, while it does that, it condenses into the water and it heats the water up so that you're not injecting ambient temperature water into a three or 400 degree boiler because you don't want to shock the boiler. That's bad for the boiler. But as that's happening, remember I said there was a gap between the um, combining nozzle and the delivery nozzle. So now that the steam is low pressure, high velocity, uh, and it's going through the combining nozzle, at such a high speed that it completely skips through the gap between the combining nozzle and the delivery nozzle. Uh, now you have a negative pressure in the injector, which causes the overflow valve to close because the, the overflow valve, um, I don't know if I said this before, but the overflow valve kind of floats uh, in the injector body if your manual overflow is uh, valve is open here. Um, if it's open, then the overflow floats, and it is able to open and close automatically as needed. So when the injector is running, there is a vacuum inside the injector body, and the overflow valve closes on its own. Now, obviously, when you go to shut off the injector, you no longer have that negative pressure in the injector, and the overflow valve reopens, and any water or steam that is left over in the injector body drains out from the overflow. Um, so why would you want to manually close the overflow? So there's there's two main reasons that you would do this. Um, the first reason, which I would not consider the most important reason, or the primary reason, would be if the uh, tank water is too hot. So let's say it's a hot summer's day and you got a black tender and obviously black absorbs sunlight, it heats the water, and you got water that's, I don't know, 100 degrees, 150 degrees uh, ambient temperatures being supplied to the boiler. In that case, the injector is not going to be able to condense as much steam into the water in the combining nozzle, which will make it harder for the injector to pick up. Um, 
and if the injector doesn't pick up then you're basically when you go to try to prime the injector and then move it into the wide open position instead of the overflow closing because there's not a negative pressure inside the injector uh, the overflow stays open and now you're blasting out full boiler pressure and water out of the overflow you've probably seen this from time to time um, as various locomotives operate their live injectors so in the event that the injector is unable to pick up the uh, water supply and the steam due to the ambient tank water temperature being too high um, what you would do in that case is I'm not a hundred percent sure now I'm just this is mainly conjecture here but I'm pretty sure this is correct is you would prime the injector and once you see that the injector is primed by observing for overflow you would manually close the overflow valve uh, to, to shut that floating valve inside the injector body and then start the injector uh, by doing this you are basically you're forcing the injector to pick up um, this is really only supposed to be done as a last ditch resort uh, it's not terribly good for the injector to be forced to force it to pick up uh, ambient tank water that's too hot but in obviously it's also more important to keep the water level in the boiler above the lowest point of the crown sheet because you don't want your boiler to explode So the other reason and the more common reason to use the overflow manual overflow shutoff valve is to use the injector as a tank heater. Um, so basically the concept behind that is if you're operating your locomotive in the winter in below freezing temperatures, uh, you're piping from the tender into the injector body is obviously is exposed to the ambient air temperature outside. So if your ambient air temperature outside is, is freezing or below freezing, there's a chance that um, those pipes will freeze and then you're in big trouble because if those pipes freeze, then the injector is not gonna operate. So what you would do in that situation is you would close the manual overflow and you would put the injector into the priming position. And what that does is once again, you're cracking the steam valve and the water valve slightly. So what is happening now is because the water can't flow out of the overflow and you're supplying steam as well, the steam heats the water in the body and, and it is forced back into the tender through the piping and such. So you're basically keeping the pipes warm and you're preventing them from freezing. So a lot of literature from injector manufacturers and things will label this valve not as an overflow shutoff, but as a heater valve, because that was the primary purpose of this valve was to use, convert the injector uh, to a heater to keep your water pipes from freezing. Okay, so now that we've talked about the Nathan 4000 automatic restarting injector, let's also talk about the Worthington Type SA feed water heater that this locomotive is also equipped with. Um, the controls are actually accessible by both the engineer and the fireman. And uh, the, the operating control for the feed water pump uh, is combined here at this uh, union joint, this universal joint, excuse me. Um, I guess you could call this a universal coupling or whatever. But um, 
So yeah, so the feed water pump really only has two main controls in the cab. Uh, you have your turret uh, valve here that supplies, uh, controls the supply of steam uh, to the pump. Uh, you would open that when you start the locomotive up and shut that off when you uh, put the locomotive away. And you have the actual operating uh, control valve, which controls the speed of the pump uh, by controlling the amount of steam you are sending to the pump from the manifold. Um, the pump itself is, uh, is multifaceted underneath the cab. Uh, in the first video you will have seen, I pointed out uh, the cold water pump is down there and it pumps water from the tender up into the heater box, which is on top of the uh, smoke box uh, where the exhaust steam mixes with the cold water and heats the water. And then the, the heated water is then piped back to the hot water pump, which then pumps that hot water into the boiler. Um, so it's a very uh, simple concept of operation. Um, basically, if you want to pump more water into the boiler, you just open up the valve further and vice versa. If you want to shut it off, you shut the valve off. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, Nathan 4000 injector on this locomotive is sized for 13,000 gallons per hour. Um, the Worthington feed water pump on this locomotive is model uh, the, the type SA, um, and it is the size six and one half SA, uh, which is sized for 14,400 gallons of water per hour. Uh, so you're talking about a lot of water here. You gotta remember that the tender only holds about 25,000 gallons of water. And the boiler itself, um, at operating level, I believe probably holds around, I wanna say 9,000 gallons to 9,500 gallons of water. And the locomotive is capable of evaporating, I would say probably anywhere between 12,000 gallons and 14,000 gallons of water per hour. Uh, at maximum throttle and maximum firing rate. So you're talking about a lot of water in a short time period here. You, with the with the feed water pump going full bore, you really only got a little less than a little less than two hours uh, before you run that tank dry. Uh, depending on the the tonnage that you're working with um, and the, the the territory that you're on, that's really that's really only about, I don't know, if your average speed is 40 miles an hour, you're really only going maybe 70 miles at the most before you have to stop for water. Uh, the Stoker, which I won't go into too much detail today, uh, this is a Type MB Stoker from the Standard Stoking Company, Standard Stoker Company, excuse me, um, and it is capable of supplying about 12 and a half tons of coal an hour. So uh, obviously the higher grade coal out east uh, means that you don't have to stoke the firebox at as high of a, a rate of, of coal that you would have, say, a, a big boy. Because big boys could consume 11 tons of coal an hour. This locomotive could probably get about the same evaporation if you were firing maybe nine or 10 tons of coal an hour, but still that's a lot of coal per hour. Um, you're looking at 25 tons in the tender full at, I don't know, let's say 10 tons an hour. Uh, that's two and a half hours before you run out of coal. So you got a little less than two hours of water and a little, about two and a half hours of, of coal if you are working the locomotive hard continuously. Now, of course, that's not always gonna be the case. You're definitely going to be running the stoker and the injectors and the pumps at a lower capacity than that most of the time, because you're not 
you're usually not always going to be full throttle uh, unless you're working upgrade with a really heavy train for an extended period of time. There's going to be times when you throw the throttle into drift or if you're going downhill or if you're just coasting on level track, uh, you don't have to have the throttle all the way out. Uh, you're your, your consumption levels are closer to, say, I don't know, um, I don't know, like uh, six tons an hour, uh, and you're only evaporating, say, 8,000 to 10,000 gallons of water an hour, then obviously your your tender range is going gonna, gonna to be higher. But that's just what this locomotive is capable of doing. Um, a few more operating details about the Worthington feed water system. Uh, it was equipped with a drifting control. So if the throttle was closed, then there was an automatic choke that would slow the hot water pump down uh, so that you wouldn't be supplying cold water to the boiler, obviously, because I probably should have explained this earlier, but the, the benefit of having a feed water heating system over using a live steam injector um, is that you are using the exhaust steam to preheat the water uh, so that, that means the steam has already been used and you are basically recycling the heat and also recondensing that steam to be into water to be put back into the boiler so instead of using live steam from the boiler to inject the water so there's a greater economy of operation to be had using a feed water heating system, exhaust steam feed water heating system, uh, to say. And they were usually advertised as being about, uh, yielding about a 10 to 15 percent efficiency increase in your coal and your water consumption. So you would consume 10 to 15 percent less coal and water using the exhausting feed water system over a live steam injector. That, or you would get an increase in locomotive capacity of 10 to 15 percent. Uh, so that would be your reason to use a feed water system like that. But obviously, if your throttle is closed, there is no steam being supplied to the cylinders or at least not enough steam being supplied to the cylinders. And so there is no exhaust steam to preheat the water. So if you're allowing the pump to run at full capacity with the throttle shut off, basically, you're just pumping ambient temperature water into the boiler. And you, like I said before, you definitely don't want to do that. Uh, that's bad for the boiler. It stresses the stay bolts, uh, the, 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 boil, the firebox sheets. Uh, that's how you break things and you don't want to break things in the pressure vessel. So Worthington was ingenious enough to include this drifting control valve um, that's attached to the side of the hot water pump. And what that does is if the steam chest pressure drops below 90 pounds, it automatically throttles the hot water pump and it prevents the hot water pump from uh, running at full speed. I forget exactly what that reduces uh, the capacity to. I want to say I have a Union Pacific uh, fireman's manual, examination manual. I think it says it throttles it down to, um, I want to say 60 gallons an hour, which is very low. I, I will correct this in the video description if that is not correct because I, I i did not bring that manual with me i only brought the the worthington manual itself which which incidentally does not have uh that information but uh yeah so it throttles the hot water pump down to prevent the hot water pump from pumping ambient temperature water into the boiler and once you're once you open the throttle back up and your, your steam chest pressure increases beyond 90 pounds, that restriction is lifted and, and the uh, pump is allowed to operate at whatever speed you want it to operate at. The only other thing uh, I wanted to talk about about the um, Worthington system is this gauge here. So this is the feed water pump gauge. Uh, and what that actually shows you is the water pressure between the cold water pump 
and the feed water heater box on top of the smoke box. So when you open the feed water pump operating valve and the, the, the cold water turbo pump spools up, uh, this pressure will start to rise. Um, and obviously the, the more you open up the operating valve, the higher the pressure rises. Now, once the hot water pump starts to operate, that pressure will stabilize uh, because now, you, it, like I said, it's basically showing you the pressure of the water between the cold water pump and the feed water heater box. So this does not actually show you uh, capacity in gallons per hour. Um, I always thought it did, and then I read the manual, and that is obviously not the case, because this, this shows you water pressure, not uh, capacity. Uh, so just wanted to be clear on that. But yeah, so basically, that's, that's basically all I have to say about the um, water supply apparatus on this locomotive, you know. The more you understand about steam, the more sort of in awe you are about how they were able to figure all this stuff out before the age of computers and, and, and automated computing systems and things like that. Everything had to be hand-drawn and calculated and figured out through trial and error. Uh, it's just really amazing what these machines could do. And it's really a shame that they're really, you know, beyond they're past their age at this point but you know i'm grateful that some of these were saved uh that so that we can sort of marvel at the ingenuity that mankind had back in the day and uh, i'm even more grateful that some of these are operating so yeah if there's anything else you would like me to cover about this locomotive um, in perhaps like a future video, definitely let, definitely let me know in the comment section and I will see if I can make another trip down here. I'm always looking for an excuse to come back here. Uh, this is a really great piece that was preserved and I'm glad it was preserved. So yeah, well, thanks for watching and until next time, see ya.